Mondays. Many people have strong emotions about Mondays, and they're usually not good. <laughs> Years ago, Karen Carpenter sang, Rainy Days and Mondays Always Get Me Down. That song went all the way to number two on the charts. Now, part of that might just be the popularity of the Carpenters, but I think part of it was because people could really relate to that song. Someone else put it this way, In my lifelong study of human beings, I have found that no matter how hard they try, they have found no way yet to prevent the arrival of Monday morning. Of course, they try. But Monday always comes and all the drones have to scuttle back to their dreary workday lives of meaningless toil and suffering. That sums up the way a lot of people think about Mondays. The only people I know that don't hate Mondays are retirees, school children on summer vacation, and pastors who take Mondays off. I used to be one of those. I don't anymore. <clears throat> Aside from that, most people hate Mondays, even Christians. Why is that? Well, for most of us, Monday means back to work after a two-day weekend. And let's face it, most people really don't care that much about their job. Someone once quipped, if you like your work, you have a career. If you don't, you got a job. And if you ask that person, they would tell you he had a job. <laughs> you know, even Christians feel this way. Why is that? Well, I think many of us think that work is part of the curse of sin. I have to go to work because Adam and Eve sinned way back in the garden. And that's not true. Theologically, that's not accurate. God had commanded Adam and Eve to work the garden before they sinned. We were actually created to be working being. Work is a part of what God created us to do. Now, it's true, sin made work harder, but sin or work itself is not part of the curse. He wants us to work. He wants us to glorify him in our work, whatever that work might be. But I think too many of us Christians think our job is our penalty. It's what we have to put up with all week long, you know, 40 hours or more a week, in order to come to the church for our ministry. You know, that's not where you have your ministry. Now, you may have a ministry at the church. Maybe you do something within the church body that would qualify as ministry, but your ministry is actually out there. We come here to be equipped for our ministry, which takes place not on Sunday morning or Sunday evening, but on Monday morning and Tuesday afternoon and Friday night. That's where the ministry happens. We come here to be equipped, to be energized, to be encouraged so that we go out there and do our ministry. Where is our ministry? Well, it's wherever you are out in the community, out on the job, whether you're a pastor or a plumber, whether you're an evangelist or an electrician, whether you're a missionary or a manual laborer, that is your ministry. And our job is to glorify God. Now, in our last study, we talked about the secret of spiritual success. According to Peter's first letter, we define spiritual success as living in such a way that unbelievers are forced to admit that we live according to our beliefs. That they really can't find anything to fault us. Not that we are perfect, but in our intentions and in our interactions, we're blameless. And in doing so, that actually glorifies God. Now, talking about success on any level is a popular subject. People always want to be a success. 
And for Christians, we want to be a spiritual success. But the secret of that spiritual success is not so popular because it's a word Peter uses time and time again in this letter, and it's the word submission or submit. And that's definitely not on our list of top ten favorite concepts in the Christian life. We don't like to submit. It goes against our nature. But Paul or Peter tells us in this letter, when we submit, not only to God, but even submitting to our earthly authorities, we are glorifying God, and that is a key to being successful in a spiritual sense, that we are making God look good in the society. Now, last time we considered spiritual success in society, how we relate to the government. Today, we want to look at spiritual success in the workplace. So if you would turn your attention in 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 18 through 20. Slaves, submit to your, yourselves to your masters with all respect, not only to those who are good and considerate, but also to those who are harsh. For it is commendable if a man bears up under the pain of unjust suffering because he is conscious of God. But how is it to your credit if you receive a beating for doing wrong and endure it? But if you suffer for doing good and you endure it, this is commendable before God. There it is again, that idea of submitting. Now you say, I'm not sure this passage really speaks to me because it's addressed to slaves and I'm not a slave. How does this apply to me? And in our culture, I think we have trouble grasping this concept. William Barclay writes, To understand the real meaning of what Peter is saying, we must understand something about the nature of slavery in the time of the early church. In the Roman Empire at this time, there were as many as 60 million slaves. 60 million slaves. There were more slaves than there were free people in the Roman Empire. Slavery began with the Roman conquests, slaves being originally prisoners taken in war. And in very early times, Rome had few slaves, but by the New Testament times, slaves were counted in the millions. And it was not just menial tasks that were performed by slaves. Doctors, teachers, musicians, actors, secretaries, and stewards were all slaves. In fact, all of the work of Rome was done by slaves. The Roman attitude at the time was that there's no point in being master of the world and doing your own work. Let the slaves do the work and let the citizens live in pampered idleness. The supply of slaves would never run out. In those days, slaves were not allowed to marry. They could live together, they could have children, but they were not legally married. And their children did not belong to them, belonged to the master. And he could do with them whatever he wanted. Just like lambs born to the sheep belong to the owner of the flock, that's how they viewed children born among slaves. Now, it'd be wrong to think that the lot of slaves was always wretched and unhappy, that they were always treated with cruelty. Many slaves were loved and trusted members of the family. But one inescapable fact dominated the whole situation. In Roman law, a slave was not a person, but a thing. And he had absolutely no legal rights whatsoever. For that reason, there could be no such thing as justice where a slave was concerned. In regard to a slave, his master's will, even his master's whim, was the only law. That's what it was like back in the Roman Empire. And many early Christians, I'm sure many who first heard this letter being read, were slaves. Many of those that 
Paul and James and John addressed in their writings were slaves. The word used here is one we might translate domestics. These are slaves that worked in the homes. And that's where a lot of them came from. That's what probably a majority of the New Testament church was made of. Were slaves that worked. And depending on the character of their master, that might be pleasant or it might be rather unpleasant. Once again, it comes back to the question, what's this have to do with us? We don't live in a society like that. We're free. We're Americans. We're not slaves to anybody. That's true. But the principles that Peter outlines for us here, and similar ones that we find in the writings of the other apostles, apply to the workplace. And so I do believe this is very applicable to us today. We begin with the absolute expectation of submission. Verse 18 begins, Submit yourselves to your masters with all respect. Now, last week we defined that term submission. And in the original Greek it meant doormat. No, it really didn't. I was just seeing if anybody was still awake. It's actually a military word. And it means to fall into rank. Anyone that's been in the military, or even if you've watched military movies, know that there are ranks. And there are higher ranks and lower ranks. And where you are in the particular armed forces that you're in depends on your rank. Someone may have a higher rank than you. Someone may have a lower rank than you. You know your place. And to submit means you fall into line, you fall into rank. That's what is being described here by Peter. Understand that there are authorities over us, and we have a responsibility toward them. Now, this isn't the only place that this kind of command is given. Paul mentioned it in three specific locations, also addressed to slaves. Back in Ephesians chapter 6, verses 5 through 8, Paul writes, Slaves, obey your earthly masters with respect and fear and with sincerity of heart, just as you would obey Christ. Obey them not only to win their favor when their eye is on you, but like slaves of Christ, doing the will of God from your hearts. Serve wholeheartedly as if you were serving the Lord, not men, because you know that the Lord will reward everyone for whatever good he does, whether he is slave or free. Here again, Paul is echoing what Peter is saying. Submit to your masters. Acknowledge their authority. Respect them, obey them, do your job, and do it wholeheartedly. This idea of, well, I'm going to go and punch in and put in my time and punch out and be done and do as little work as possible is not the meaning of spiritual success according to the New Testament like the story of the politician that was going through a plant. You know how they do that around election time? You know, they go around and shake hands with the working man. And the politician comes up to this one guy on the assembly line, and he says, how long have you been working here? And the fellow replied, ever since my boss threatened to fire me. (laughs) Sometimes that has a way of, of getting us motivated to actually do our job. Shouldn't have to come to that. You notice Paul says, obey them not only when their eye is on you, but doing the will of God from the heart. Over in Colossians chapter 3, Paul has similar instructions. Beginning in verse 22, 
Slaves, obey your earthly masters in everything. And do it not only when their eye is on you and to win their favor, but with sincerity of heart and reverence for the Lord. Whatever you do, work at it with all your heart as working for the Lord, not for men, since you know that you will receive an inheritance from the Lord as a reward. It is the Lord Christ you are serving. And then in Titus chapter 2, in verse 9, teach slaves to be subject to their masters in everything, to try to please them, not to talk back to them, and not to steal from them, but to show that they can be fully trusted, so that in every way they will make the teaching about God our Savior attractive. There is the spiritual success part. It's not just so that we look good. We want to make God look good. We want to be a positive reflection of Christ wherever we go. You see, people know that you're a Christian. One way or another, they will know that you follow Jesus Christ. What kind of impression do they have of Christ or Christianity based on what they know of you? Years ago, I used to work at a print shop back in the state of Virginia. And one of the regular customers that that print shop had was a Christian organization. And everybody there knew that I was starting a new church, and they knew I was a pastor, they knew I was a Christian. And one day the boss came to me, and he was not a believer. And, and he said, uh, trying to make a joke, well, I suppose the representative from this particular organization, I suppose she's doing her job because every time she walks in the door, everybody here says, Jesus Christ. What kind of an impression were, was she making on those people? It wasn't a good one. And the way people view you is going to affect they view, the way they view Christ. And if we are, to use the phrase, a model employee, they're going to be more inclined to think positively about Jesus because of the association. But the opposite is also true. We can push people farther away from Christ by being a poor representative of him on the job. Whether it's our immediate supervisors or their bosses or our co-workers. Or maybe we're in a position of management and we have people under us. How do they view Jesus when they view us? There's an old saying that I think is very true. You may be the only Bible some people ever read. There are people in your workplace that may never darken the door of a church. They may never pick up a copy of God's written word. But they see you. They see your life. What is their impression of Jesus? Oh, that person says he's a Christian, but every time there's work to be done, they disappear. Or, I can't trust them any farther than I can throw them. Those are poor reflections on God. It's the exact opposite of what Peter defines as spiritual success, which is to make God look good. And so we have in these passages both actions and attitudes for the workplace. We're told to submit, to be subject, to obey. Those are all actions. And we're to do so with respect and with sincerity of heart. Those are attitudes. Now, I don't want this to all come across negatively. Peter's letter is all about hope. 
That's kind of the one theme you see throughout the book. And as J.I. Packer writes, an ethic of hope pervades the New Testament. By that, he means we determine our actions and our attitudes, which is basically what ethics is all about, based on a biblical concept of hope. The fact that Jesus Christ is coming again, he is going to judge every person, rewarding the faithful and punishing the unfaithful. So with that in mind, I would like to propose this evening a work ethic of hope. And it has three basic ideas. One, work hard. Paul wrote, whatever you do, work at it with all your heart. Whatever your job is, if you're on the the clock, work, and do your very best. That may not always be someone else's best, but it's your best. You work hard. Every task we undertake needs to be done to the best of our ability, not just enough to get by. That same print shop where I used to work, I worked in the back. Uh, what they called bindery, and uh, someone had posted a sign in, in the back one day, and it said, good enough is not good enough. What had happened was there was a print job that was done, and whoever did the job said, well, it's good enough, but the customer did not agree, and it had to be done over again. Don't just try to be good enough. Do the best you can. Now, if the best you can isn't good enough, that's a whole other story. But the effort needs to be there. Work hard. Secondly, work honestly. Not only when their eye is on you. Not only to impress. Now, again, we want to, we want to make a good impression. But we want that to be sincere. So we work just as hard when the boss isn't there as we do when he is. So work honestly. And then thirdly, work humbly. This talks about our attitudes of respect and humility that accompany our actions of obedience. The obligation of the Christian employee is as unconditional as as it is universal. To be subject is a passive in, uh, imperative verb. So it's a command. We submit ourselves. And as we're going to find out, it doesn't matter what kind of a boss we have. The standard is the same. So I ask you, are we known as employees who work hard, who work honestly, who work humbly? Here's a quick way to know for sure. What if somebody came to you tomorrow morning at work and said, last month the company installed video cameras throughout the workplace and each employee's actions are being reviewed? Would you be nervous? Would it bother you that when you didn't think anybody was looking, somebody was looking? Or would you say, well, that's fine. I've done my job. I work hard no matter what. That's fine. I call this the work ethic of hope because it's motivated by the fact that one day we will stand before Christ and give an account for our lives. What this means is that ultimately Christ is our boss. In fact, that's a word you could substitute for Lord. You know, we say Jesus is Lord. Lord Jesus Christ, as though that was his first name that he doesn't use. No, it's a function of who he is. He is our master. He is our boss. And one day, we will give an account to him. You can think of it as the eternal payday. When we receive our reward for what we have done. You know... Paul wrote in one of those passages, um, obey them not just for their sake, but as you're serving the Lord. That's not something we have to pretend. We really are serving the Lord. 
we really are working for God. Now, God may not sign our paycheck here on earth, but one day he will, on the eternal sense. So, regardless of who our earthly employer might be or our supervisor, our ultimate boss is God. And guess what? He does see everything we do. He doesn't need cameras. He sees it all. And he's going to reward us accordingly. And the main emphasis in Peter's text is really the last of those terms, be humble. We're to work for our employers with respect. And it is our duty as Christians to have a respectful attitude. Not just doing what we're supposed to do, but doing it with the right frame of mind. See, it's more than our paycheck that's involved. Our testimony depends on it. Yeah, okay, but I, I don't know. I'm having a hard time wrapping my head around this. How do you do that in a practical sense? Well, I found a really good example in a book written by Stanley Baldwin. I love his title, Take This Job and Love It. And it's really geared toward Christian employees. He relates how an employee put of his, of his put his principle into practice. He says, you know how a boss can make an employee look good to the rest of the company? You know, sometimes covering for his mistakes. I believe an employee can make his boss look good too. And that's what I want to do. And as I thought about it, I realized he was right. A boss whose workers produce well, make few mistakes, and have good attitudes will probably look very good in the eyes of his supervisors. And then he concludes with this. If you want to get along famously with your boss, try to make him or her look good. Your boss will probably love you for it. And think of it that way. What can I do in doing my job that's going to make them look good? Work hard. Work honestly. Work humbly. Because when you make them look good, more than likely, your life is going to be a little easier. Maybe not, but you have a better chance at that. Now, if you think Peter's admonition in the first half of verse 18 is difficult, let's read on. He says, Slaves, submit to your masters with all respect, not only to those who are good and considerate, but also to those who are harsh. In other words, submission does not depend upon the temperament of the employer. This is what I call the absent exception to submission. <laughs> Meaning there isn't one. Oh, but you don't know my boss, someone says. He's the most demanding, demeaning slave driver you've ever met. And understand, that guy's self-employed. <laughs> it doesn't matter. Peter states that we're to submit not only to the good ones, but to the unreasonable ones as well. That word harsh in the Greek is the word scolios. We get the word scoliosis from it. It means curved, bent, crooked. That's the kind of employer he's talking about. Someone that is unfair. You think you work for a crook? This verse is for you. Your boss is unfair? Better listen up. God says that even when the employer is unbearable, we are to bear it, and with the right attitude. Why? Because as we've seen previously, we are ultimately working for the Lord. Now, I do believe there is a limit to this. If your boss is treating you in a way that is contrary to the law of the land, you don't have to put up with that. If the boss is treating you contrary or trying to get you to do things contrary to a union contract, if that's the place that you work, you don't have to put up with that. Remember, Paul was a Roman citizen, and there were times when someone was about to violate his rights, and he said, now stop. 
you hold on a minute. I'm a Roman citizen. You're not going to treat me this way. If you have a boss that is forcing you to break laws, if they are treating you against the contract, standing up to that is not going against God's word. Now, we need to do it in the right way. I think we need to do it again with the right attitude. And especially if your boss is trying to get you to do something that violates God's law or even man's law, no, we don't just go along with it. But when someone is just making your life difficult, that doesn't excuse us from what God is telling us to do. Because ultimately we are working for the Lord. You know, I think there's another reason why we must maintain a proper attitude regardless of the character of the boss. Anyone can work for a good boss. You know, that's easy. If the boss is reasonable and, and makes it a, a pleasant workplace, sure, anybody can get along in that environment. But believers are to go above and beyond what everybody else would do. This is what makes Christianity distinctly Christian. Jesus taught in Matthew 5, verses 43 through 47, you've heard it said, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I tell you, love your enemies. Pray for those who persecute you, that you may be sons of your Father in heaven. He causes the sun to rise on the evil and the good. He sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. If you love those who love you, what reward will you get? Even the sinners do that. And if you greet only your brothers, what are you doing more than others? Don't the pagans even do that? If we want to stand out from the rest of the world, we've got to go above and beyond what everybody else is doing. And when people see that we are still working hard, working honestly, working humbly, even with a boss that's unreasonable and demanding and sometimes mean, that's going to stand out. Now, I know it's not easy. It's really difficult when our employer is difficult. But it can be done in the power of the Holy Spirit. We see examples in biblical personalities like Joseph in the Old Testament, whose work ethic was noted in a number of situations that were far from ideal or even pleasant. But he was a faithful worker, and he excelled in spite of the circumstances. David, you, you think you've got a bad boss? How many of them have chucked a spear at you? I mean, King Saul tried to kill him more than once. And yet, David was a faithful servant to the king. Daniel, his fellow employees tried to set him up, not just to get fired, but to be killed. Nehemiah, he had to tiptoe through political correctness and dangerous adversaries to get the job done. It can be done. And we who have the Spirit of God living in us have no excuse to not fulfill God's Word. There is no exception to this principle. But when we do, we will experience the almighty endorsement of submission. Twice, Peter encourages his readers in the text to do the right thing because it is commendable before God. God always rewards obedience to authority because it is actually obedience to him. Have you ever been overlooked for a promotion or a raise? Have you ever had other people get credit for the hard work you have done? You feel like the only time the boss says anything to you is when something is wrong, not when you do something right? Don't worry. God sees it all. And in the words of Matthew 6, 4, your father who sees what is done in secret will reward you openly. 
You may have to wait for that eternal payday, but it is coming. And not one thing that you do at the workplace with all of your heart in respect and obedience to those above you, God is going to reward that. We tend to think that God only rewards things we do for the church. You know, it's only souls that we bring to Christ, or it's only work that we do in some kind of ministry that God's going to reward. No, he is going to reward your work on the job, because ultimately he is your boss. I like the way Chuck Swindoll puts it. Our focus then should not be consumed with getting a raise at the office, but with getting praise from God. Not with getting the glory for ourselves, but giving the glory to Him. It all boils down to that old question, what's my motivation? Why do I do what I do? Christianity introduced a new attitude toward work. It's the conviction of the New Testament that everything we do is done for Christ. Whatever you do in word or deed... Do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus. Do it all for the glory of God. Work isn't just done for an earthly employer. It's not just done for personal prestige or to make more money. It's done for God. Now, it's true. We get paid. We have to earn a living to support ourselves and our families. But beyond this, for the Christian, it should be our conviction that we're doing our work for him. Ultimately, everything we do is for him, and that means we do the very best that we can. We may have to put up with an ogre in the office, but ultimately we are serving our Lord and Savior. Can we do that? Can we do that consistently? Can we do that for the employer that's crooked and, and mean and spiteful? Have we allowed ourselves to get so caught up in office politics and personality conflicts and downright resentment of others that we lose sight of the big picture? The Bible teaches us that no matter what we do, we're doing it for the Lord. The pay we get, the system under which we operate, the kindness or the orneriness of our boss, those are all incidental. I'm not saying they're unimportant, but the basic principle is that we work for the Lord. And our work should reflect that. Spiritual success happens when we live our lives in such a way that the unbelieving world sees a difference. And in the workplace, this can be particularly difficult. But remember... The light shines the brightest in the darkest of circumstances. Our testimony is never more evident than when it is least expected. Think about that. Our testimony is never more evident than when it is least expected. So if you're really struggling with work, you're really struggling with the way you're being treated at work, this is an opportunity for you to shine. This is an opportunity for you to to show to the world what a difference Jesus makes. So when people see you coming, they say, now there is a Christian, instead of saying Jesus. What kind of an impression are we making on the people we work for, the people we work with? That's what spiritual success in the workplace is about. Would you bow with me as we close in prayer? Father God, we acknowledge that you created us to be working beings. Even before Adam and Eve sinned, you put them in the garden to work it. Now, we understand that sin has made work more difficult. And working with and working for sinners complicates issues but we are called to work. Thank you for the strength and the ability to work, the opportunities to be employed, to earn a living and support our families. 
Father, I pray that we might see it not just as a job, not just a way to make ends meet, to pay the bills, but as an opportunity to be a good reflection of you. That through our work, we might be a witness. That others will see Christ in us. So I pray that you would go with us from this place to wherever we go throughout the week. May people see Christ in us and have a favorable impression of you because of the way we work. That's what it means to glorify you, and that's what our lives are to be about. We pray this in Jesus' name.